Let's um, continue from, from last time when I was uh, speaking about the benefits of going to college and how that's risen over time and how tuition is also risen. But one interpretation of the rise in tuition, I think it's an important part of it, may not be the whole story, is that tuition increased because the benefits increased, because the earnings of college graduates increased. So the earnings of college graduates increase, that means that any sector, any industry that uses really large amounts of college graduates will have an increase in their relative cost. Right? I mean, all sectors may have an increase in, in, in one cost. Well, I mean, you have to worry whether you're keeping your price level constant or not. So, but if, if, if all other factor prices are constant, let's take a very simple experiment. An increase in the cost of college graduates would increase the cost of producing every sector. But it's really relative cost that determines output. And those sectors that use a really large amount of college graduates, their costs will increase relatively more. Right? Simple, basic, general equilibrium, if you will, result. Okay? And we know that college, the production of college graduates is very intensive in college graduates. That's what I mentioned last night. It's very clear. I mean, just look at the uh, inputs into, uh, let's say, college education. It's mainly labor. The costs are mainly labor costs. And the main labor cost is, uh, is that of the teachers and administrative staff. And they're all minimal, minimal M MAs. And mainly the faculty PhDs. At the major institutions, you go down to lesser institutions. They're still all college graduates, the minimum, and often many, say, take Loop College, not a very uh, distinguished institution here in Chicago. Most of their teachers will have a, all their teachers will have at least a college education, and many of them will have masters. Some will have doctors. So that means college education is going to rise in cost. And as I said last time, people have, have uh, misunderstood the causation going on. They look at the increase in, in tuition. So college costs increase and tuition increases. It's true, these are not profit maximizing sectors, but uh, whatever, they're max whatever they're doing, let's say whatever they're maximizing, an increase in cost will tend to increase their price. I mean, as a pretty general result. Right? Those in 301, and when I dealt with the nonprofits, I showed some kind of results like that. Or maybe I didn't, I mean, maybe I didn't, because uh, I didn't lecture on that when you we were in class. But uh, uh, typically, when I was giving all the lectures in 301, I would have a, a lecture on nonprofits, which is kind of interesting, not discussed much in um, price theory. You can model it, get some interesting results. Um, and, and very general assumptions, you'll get an increase in cost. You'll, you'll get a cost function. You'll get a cost function that's very similar to the ordinary cost function. And, um, and therefore, you get an increase in, in one cost. Costs will rise, and very general assumptions, prices will rise. Okay? So even though these are not, not non-profits, you don't expect that to happen, and, and it did happen. And you can date the rise in tuition more or less from the rise in the cost of uh, inputs. I don't know if people have dated that very carefully, but uh, you know, if you just look at broadly at the data, you can see that. All right, but as I say, people get the causation wrong because they interpret that as saying, "Well, you have an increase in tuition, it makes it, you know, it reduces the incentive to go to college." When the increase in tuition is in part related to increased incentives to go to college and higher returns. Okay, so. That's true in general, and you do find, and I'll come back to this a little more, that 
along, you, had, you did get an increase in not only in the earnings of college graduates relative to high school graduates, but you had an increase in the net benefits, the rate of return, I say, on a college education, despite the increase in tuition. So, I don't feel sorry for students who have to pay this higher tuition. Uh, I mean, they, you know, there's a lot of complaint about it. It could, and it is a, it is a problem. You know, if you have, a, you come back to find capital constraint issue. No, that does raise some questions. But then you have greater out-of-pocket expenses, and some people may not be able to finance that. Most people have a tougher time. But, but for the most part, uh, the college people who get to college have a much better deal now than they had 30 years ago. Despite the rise, a much better deal. Not just a moder modestly better deal, but a much better deal than they had. So think about that when you think of proposals, you know, to subsidize college students or, or systems where college students go through for almost zero tuition. I mean, you think of that from an equity point of view. Is, is that a good system? We are taxing everybody including the low educated people to support the high educated people who are going to earn a lot more than everybody else. And it strikes me as a system with very uh, perverse effects, not only on efficiency criteria, but on, I mean, it, it, on, if, you, if you think widening inequality through public policy is not a good idea for lowering efficiency, which I would certainly say, uh, most of you I think would say that. It's hard to see how you justify such a system. I mean, I, I find it hard to see if anybody thinks they have a good justification. Uh, now's the time to raise it. Anybody have any ideas? The idea is that you pay for it like by a more progressive tax system. Okay. Yeah, yes, the higher income people pay a more progressive tax, but they still end up with higher income. And and if you increase the degree of progressivity, so you take away any increase of benefits, then are you sure you're going to encourage the people to get the higher education, which is now more efficient for the economy to get? So you've got to be careful. So you start out with a progressive income tax structure. Yes, you'll take back some of it. But you'll take back some of it even if you're not subsidizing that. Right? So what's the advantage? So you can, you can justify it. You know, the ways to justify it would be the extra, important externality. So the important externalities. So somehow you want to subsidize going uh, to college, and maybe there are. Although you know it's been a tough ta task for economists to show those externalities. That doesn't mean there aren't. Uh, uh, we do know, but it is clear that people get a big private benefit from going. Uh, there's even controversy over that, but whether it's it's college or ability, but I think that's been pretty well put, uh, put to rest now, that people get a big private benefit. So we have to argue, is there enough externalities to justify heavy, heavy subsidies on people to go to college, and do you want to subsidize in a form of lower tuition in, in, some, other, in some other way? Uh, and it, I, it, no, there's no definitive answer that's available about that. I don't think that the externalities are big enough to justify. I think most of the benefits go to the individual, but as I said, that hasn't been, um, there's still a lot of controversy on that. So I wouldn't say that's a definitive statement. That, that would be the direction you have to go. Because you, you, you are definitely creating more inequality by doing it. Okay? Now, it may be justified, but you may offset that inequality, some of the change, but you gotta be careful about offsetting it if, because you want more, if, if the, if the benefits of going to college rise, you want more people to go to college. That's the efficiency. Uh, I was going to lecture, let's talk about this a little later. Let me talk about this now. There's an increase. There's an increase. Well, yeah, let's go back to our basic factor, which is. WC. Has been greater than zero since 19. In 
motion controls. Okay. So some people say, well, that's led to greater inequality. And therefore it's bad. Let's say you accept that greater inequality is bad. Okay. On the other hand, it means to the extent this has happened because there's been an increased demand for college graduates, right? Um, greater technological bias technological change so college graduates shift in the economy or sectors are intensive in college education, international trade. I went through all these things before. Um, the rate of return on college has gone up. And so from that point of view, it's a good thing. I mean, if I told you the rate of return on physical capital has gone up because productivity has risen, we just, we, I don't think any of you jump up and start arguing this is a bad thing because it means more inequality. I mean, you may have aspects to it. You'd say it's great to have a higher rate of return. What we're trying to do in an economy is get higher productivity, right? That's, that's what the goal is. I mean, to the extent you get higher incomes because you're investing a lot more, that may be good, but you know you have to subtract out the cost of the capital to measure how much net improvement there is over, say, over some lifetime or some discounted value sense. So productivity is what you try to get. You try to get something for nothing or for very little. That's, I mean, that's, that's when the economy is functioning better. So now we have an increase in, in let's say, demand for college graduates. Um, the, the rate of return on this investment has, has gone up. That's a good thing. You're getting bigger bang for your buck. Uh, yes, you want more people be induced to go and mark, and if you allow these prices to respond, that's a good thing. So it's associated with greater inequality, which may not be good. I and mean, it has been a significant increase in earnings and uh, inequality since 1980. A lot of that related to the increase in the uh, benefits for more skill, not only education but other measures of skill. So, uh, so if you look, I mean, you, it's shown in a lot of ways. You look at residual in some regression of, um, let's see, earnings on education and experience, the coefficient on education goes up, has gone up, the coefficient on experience has risen a little, and the residual has ri risen a lot, so more inequality in the residual, and people have try, try to track that down, they see some evidence that because the more skilled people are not captured by education and experience, they're getting more poor return. So that's it. that would be saying, well, there's higher rates of return to investing in skill. That's good. You may want to combat that in various ways, but you have to be careful if you don't combat it in ways where you reduce the incentive to take advantage of this, because you want more people. If the productivity in this sector goes up, you want, just like the productivity of real capital went up, you want more investment in real capital. Right? You generally, you, you'll get that unless there are hindrances to it. That's what you want here. Right? So, uh, uh, the way to think about the inequality issue, the way I, I think you should be thinking about the inequality issue, um, is, well, why, isn't more, why aren't more people taking advantage of that increase in the very big increase in the returns to college? As I mentioned last time, the average college premium since then in U.S., U.S., So, there's 
been this big, huge increase. And some countries have seen a very big increase, as I said, in number going to college, fraction of an age cohort going to college, um, the younger ages where this is kicking in. And the U.S., you've seen a significant increase for uh, women, but a much smaller increase for men. Okay. So one of the reasons is that if you look, if you plot a time series, as I, I showed you, but it's worth emphasizing, drop out of high school fraction, fraction, in some, since 1975, is let's say 0.25, 0.3, then something like that for men, boys, and for girls, it's been something maybe like that. Girls. A low for girls and for boys, so that's pretty high still for girls. So you cannot explain all the increase in the, in the college graduation of women by by this, but certainly why we're not getting more in the United States through is that we drop, a lot of people don't finish high school, you can't go on. And as I said before, we've dropped from being one of the, in, in 1970, being one of the highest ranked countries in high school completion rates, around 10th, to being now like 25th out of a hundred some odd countries. So we dropped a lot. So not all countries uh, uh, have seen this. Many countries have increased the fraction of graduating high school. So I think the solution to, to this question, well, at least a partial solution, maybe more than that, to this, to this question of, well, you know, it's an equality question, and why an efficiency question, why, let's see if we can get more people completing high school. How do we manage to get more people completing high school in an efficient, in an efficient way? All right? Or you could say you spend more, spend more on K-12, but we spend more than any other country in the world per student. And we've increased a lot over time in the United States. So, yeah. Maybe you can just spend more, you get some bang for the buck, but clearly we're not getting a, that much of a bang for the much increased spending, at least in terms of dropout rates. Because since 1975, we've greatly increased the per capita spending, per student spending in K-12 in the United States. And there may be other measures that show improvement, but certainly not in this measure, which is an important measure. If people aren't finishing high school, well, they People who drop out of high school are condemned pretty much to a pretty awful situation in almost every dimension. Almost every dimension. Can you think of a dimension where they're not? Earnings? Well, we know. What about employment? We know. Unemployment rates are low. Out of the labor force, it's high for these groups, for reasons that are a little more controversial. Uh, health, way below. Um, name me a dimension where they do really well. You are. Can you come up with anything? <laughs> I mean, I've. I've thought a lot about this problem. I can't come up with anything. I mean, you can come up with nonsensical things, but in terms of anything really important, like marriage, important decision in people's lives, they have a much worse situation. They don't marry nearly as much, and they divorce in much higher numbers. So you think of marriage as a positive good, and there's a lot of, I mean, you can prove that in terms of a lot of behavior. That they do much worse, not only getting married, but they don't stay married in any way nearly the same numbers. Okay. So I'll, I'll 
maybe next lecture I'll work, work out a more general formulation of the education problem with Helen's on. Bring in marriage, so I'll talk about more of that. You have some. Good. No, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, how would you explain why people drop out then? Good question. I have some ideas on it. I'm not confident how fully, whether my R, my R, R squared is 0.2 or 0.95, <laughs> but, um, or 0.1 even. Uh, let me tell you how, where, what I think has been going on. Uh, and come back to marriage. The stability of the U.S. family, starting earlier than 1975, uh, but starting in the late 60s, has declined a lot, particularly for the groups that are dropping out a lot. African Americans, Hispanic, minority groups mainly, they have the high dropout rates. I mean, you come from an educated family, reasonably educated family, the chances are very high you're going to finish high school. Uh, so this high rate is heavily concentrated in certain groups. Now, these are the groups you, you just see a lot of problems with. And one the most obvious, important one, hardest one to do anything about, is the family structure has really been shot. Uh, it's unstable. Often, I think in, in the black community, 60, more than 60% of the children are raised with a single parent. Um, and and it, the evidence, it was, people are still working on this evidence, but hard not to believe that isn't a, 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 a significant factor. Um, but it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been demonstrated how, how, how big it is. But I, I would put my number one factor would be that. The second factor I would stress would be the schools. That despite spending more, that the schools are particularly, you know, available to the children who are likely to drop out are, uh, are poor quality, there's a lot of disruption in them, and not easy problem to overcome, but I think charter schools, vouchers, and more competition are movements in the right direction. But that still only takes a, a, a small fraction of all students. I think that will help, particularly these students. I don't think students from the middle class will need that, but I think these students will benefit a lot from that. The peer environment. Um, Roland Fryer, who was a <coughs> professor at Harvard, was, was here, a postdoc for several years. He's written a, a, a number of pages, one called Acting White, the pressure on black students from, by acting white was meant being a good student and, and so on, staying out of trouble and the like. So that kind of peer pressure uh, in many neighborhoods is strong. Now people escape it, and people, somebody like Roland, who was black, and he came in from a very poor neighborhood, he, he, he escaped it. But uh, when you make it harder to escape, a certain fraction are going to be captured by that. So that would be a, a third factor. These would be the three forces that I would stress. And spending as a, as a really minor part of the problem, because we've increased spending a lot. Um, you don't spend it right, you're not going to get a big, big pay.
understanding of the Heckman stuff on GEDs is that they look similar on uh, cognitive traits, but they look they look similar to high school graduates along cognitive dimensions, but they look similar to high school dropouts along non-cognitive dimensions, uh, such as persistence. And, um, All right, it's mainly non-cognitive. That's fine. Yeah. yeah, you probably know it. I mean, I've read a lot of these papers, but I forgot what exactly the yeah. results were. That's well, fine. I mean, but, yeah, but so in that case, I would think it's explain? just that you know, the, if, if there's sort of a cognitive barrier to getting a high school diploma, that there are people that have that have the sufficient cognitive ability to pass the test or whatever, but they don't. You know, it's harder for them to exert effort, or they don't like to. Or they well, there's have the a simpler way. There's a simple. What you're saying out. makes some sense. But there's a simpler way. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, that's all true too, but somehow it basic. I mean, the first time I heard the study, I knew it couldn't have much effect. And why? It takes very little time to get a GED degree. To go from a high school dropout to, I'm not sure Edwin gives an exact date. What's the exact date on that? Uh, I don't remember that. I forgot. But yeah. it's very little time. It's easy. You no, know, if it takes a very little time, how could it be worth a lot? It makes no sense that it could be worth a lot when you only have to put that little bit of time in on it. Uh, you go, and then we could cut high school and give you that little bit of time and everybody will, will do great. So you have to have enormous inefficiency in a high school system to believe that's going to work. So as soon as you hear that, you have to be skeptical this is going to have any big effect. And then you've done the studies, which suggest it doesn't have much of an effect. Yeah. There looks to be this election effect, right? That like the better dropouts get a GED. They do. The better dropouts do get the GED, but still, the better uh, everybody should drop out if by yeah, well, if getting the GED, yeah. you can take five hours study for the, and get the GED and do as well, close to as well as the high school drop. So there's something that doesn't make sense in that. And I, and I would conclude that the people who complete high school aren't that stupid. <laughs> and it's, the, it's that the GED isn't worth much. And the market doesn't give it much value. The market recognizes that it doesn't work. Okay, so they earn about the same as, we're uh, pretty close. Okay. Yeah. Is there any uh, sheepskin effect in having a high school diploma? Well, it's a good question. I mean, this is a long debated question in human capital uh, literature. It's part, you know, it's a part of the more general screening analysis. Um, is it education that's raising your earnings, or is it the more able who are getting the education and therefore would have higher earnings anyway, and this is a way the market is sep separating out the more able from the less able, right? That, uh, so that's called screening, and sheepskin effect is a particular version of screening. If you mean by a sheepskin effect, the fact that you have, the mere fact that you have the degree, regardless of what goes into getting that degree. Uh, so I would say, I don't think there's a big sheepskin effect per se. Uh, I think there is an effect uh, that the people who don't graduate are people who are low in non-cognitive or other skills. And that's clearly going to have an effect on, on their earning power, uh, maybe in addition to their education level, or maybe as, uh, because they get the, the greater education. Uh, I think in screening in general, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to say it doesn't have any effect, uh, but the more and more work we've had, and they're not easy to separate out, because at a private level, it doesn't make any difference why you're getting higher earnings. Is it because, well, you, the you know, you're more educated, you're more able, and it's low cost for you, low, low cost for you to go to college, and college people are going to earn more, so you go to college, right? And that, that's the screening model. You have, to, you have to make it, fix it up to make sure that's, that that works out. But that that's the screening model. Um, and at, at the private level, it doesn't make any difference. That's the reason you're getting it is because you're learning a lot more from uh, college or learning how to learn from from college. So you have to look at other level, other ways of doing it. And the best way of thinking about it 
conceptually is suppose it's a country as a whole uh, increases. You have to be careful why this increase is, it, it, is coming about. For some exogenous reason, the fraction to getting a higher education. Let's say, oh, you look at different regions and they have the same, they're pretty much the same in all dimensions, but in some reason, regions, uh, you start school at earlier age, so students end up with more school. That's often an instrument used. Um, and then you look at sort of the aggregate incomes that come for that region. Do you find a payoff from college when you do it now at the aggregate level that's related to what looks like similar to the payoff from college at the micro level? People have done that. And generally speaking, they find pretty similar results, although not all speak the same way. So uh, my conclusion has been that there is, maybe there is a sheepskin effect, maybe there is a screening effect in your <coughs> education, but it's not the dominant, dominant factor. I mean, if you take the extreme model of version of a screen, screening effect, it means all the money we spend on education is completely wasted. I mean, basically that's what it means. Yeah. That's what it means. I, I can't believe we got ourselves into that kind of equilibrium because there's a lot of, and, and people have worked this out more formally, uh, companies will experiment around. They'll hire, uh, instead of hiring a college graduate, uh, uh, they'll say they'll hire high school graduates and they'll give them tests and so on, so they'll determine their ability. Why make them go through, you know, various loops? They can certainly determine cognitive abilities, and that test to determine personality traits and the like. And they would do more of that, and that's relatively cheap. You don't have to go four years to college. They'll find cheaper ways. And so, there's a few papers that say if you're gonna, if you experiment around the equilibrium, screening equilibrium, uh, it, it's often unstable. That if, if companies are experimenting. Uh, trying out different workers and seeing how they do is another way of thinking about it. So, I mean, I haven't proved that it is not an important sheep human effect. That's the reason I believe it's not the dominant force in what's, in what's going on. Uh, but, you know, it, 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 this is a literature that's been going on for at least 50 years, uh, versions of, of that literature. I, I discussed it in my human capital book published a long time ago. I wasn't the first one to think about discussing it, so it's, it's an old literature. But I think we got more evidence since then, and the evidence I had suggested to me it wasn't a major factor. I think the further evidence has <coughs> come out even stronger. How people look at twins, identical least abilities coming out in the same environment, you give one twin more education. Hopefully, that's more randomly determined. And what are their earnings? It's another variation. How much would you attribute to improvement in outside options? Say a child who is making the decision between studying today and you know just call it play has a lot better or might have a lot better outside options than say 30 or 40 years ago, like more TV channels, video games, and these kinds of things. So why people drop out? You mean? Yeah. So while the returns to college might have gone gone up, like the outside options between making you know in, investing in education and not investing, those might have risen too. Ooh, and what are the examples you have in mind? Like, I'm, I'm particularly, I'm thinking about the child making the decision between, you know, whether to study and go for, say, a high school degree, which to which the returns are going to grow much later, or just play video games or watch TV instead. Like, 30 or 40 years ago with three or five TV channels, that might have been a lot less attractive than today with digital cable. Yeah. Well, you're saying that consumption... They have to forego consumption by going to yeah. school and the utility you can get exactly, from yeah. so spending the utility that terms, time. They might actually be better off. Spend that time and it could, you know, there might be something to it. Uh, but they're giving up that an awful lot. And that's not only in earnings, the benefit the health benefits have risen over time, the marital benefits have risen over time. So you have to put a lot of weight on that increasing consumption. But that you know, that could be a factor. Um, also, you have to give some additional weight to the fact, I don't know if this has increased over time, but the high school dropouts commit a lot of the crime, and they spend a lot of time in prison, so I don't know if they're playing video games or holding up the stores, I mean, <laughs> outside of But, you know, but in principle, that could be a force.
organized. That's a good point. Anybody else has some good points? Oh. Only good points. Oh, I don't have a good point. I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> your point? Um, you mentioned that family instability likely <coughs> caused higher dropout rates amongst high schoolers. But families are complicated. What specific mechanisms do you think about family instability to cause people to drop out from high school? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I don't like easy questions. <laughs> I mean, it's easy in a sense. You can see pretty clear mechanisms. Isn't it? And where's Dan? Is he around today? Oh, Dan. Well, you're working on exactly that yeah, problem. Yeah. You tell him. You give him the answer. <laughs> I would say it has something to do with early childhood development, and, and like Professor Becker was saying, these families are pretty unstable. And so if there's no father around, the mother's working a lot, then the uh, there won't be much investment in the kids at these crucial periods, at young ages, and then they won't even be prepared to to take on school, and they won't be ready to um, graduate from high school even if they wanted to. And you had now you have these data now that says uh, if they're anticipating it looks like a divorce is coming, the Father yeah. begins to invest less, right? Yeah, exactly. So these in, these unstable families, even during marriage, are investing a lot less because the, my hypothesis is that the father knows he's not going to be around and so starts sort of disengaging from the family from beforehand. Yes, I think that's a, one important mechanism. There's less investment in the kid. I mean, you can give sociological language for a role model the father isn't around. So my prediction would be these hurt boys more than girls. I don't know if there's is there any evidence on that. At least it hurts boys more than girls on behavioral problems. I mean, boys yeah. tend to have more behavioral problems anyway, but divorce seems to hurt them Very especially. Yeah, that, the theory would sort of suggest that. So that would be, I, I think, the, the main. There may be other mechanisms. But I think, you know, you, you're in a family where the parents are fighting a lot, and, and then they get divorced. It's, it doesn't make for a very good environment, and so on. And you may not be learning it very well and develop behavioral problems and the like. Okay. Any, come with, yeah. So, uh, you, you mentioned that there, there, there isn't an obvious congressional capital market for people that want to fund their college education plans. We also make the something that there's, there's risk in doing a progressive tax where it disagrees the that incentive to go to college. Do you see any action to actually work on some of these like, efficiencies? Well, you know, there has been. Is there a certain point you can, and then you start worrying about it? Oh, I'll have to something. So, a couple of things has happened. One, you know, there's been a, a, an increase in availability of government loans and grants. And the Obama administration has pushed that, but even before that, that was happening. You had an increase. For the first time, we get, we got, get, to get developed during the 90s. Uh, for-profit companies that invest, provide loans for investment in the uh, human capital of borrowers. That is, you can borrow to finance your education, particularly college or post-college education. These are for-profit companies who are trying to package these loans and then, like a mortgage-backed security, these would be a education uh, loan-backed securities. Uh, you know, with the fallout in the financial sector in the last couple of years, a lot of these have gone on. But they were a response to the high so, tuition. So you did get responses. You see, did see both governmental and market responses to this. still subsidized. I, think those are, be, I guess the question is, because I think some of the Well, the third method. Oh, but, but let me just want to add one thing. Uh, and you find some of the elite, more well-endowed schools and went to went to systems where you know they had need blind admissions and then everybody who was admitted would get enough through loans or something to finance their education. That would be another a way that people have responded to it. So these are all ways. Are they all equally good? I, you know, I don't think so. But um, but, they are, but they were definitely responses to the increase in tuition. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Regarding the information. Set when people make a decision. I mean, it's hard to believe that the kids who are 14 or 15 actually know uh, what are their returns to college, their returns to high school, and maybe not even their parents know, or their parents don't have enough, they don't talk enough during 
so there's family disruption and basically these children don't know that there's a much higher return or underestimate your returns from going to college and from graduating from high school. So, so children underestimate more in the United States than in uh, Europe or Japan or Korea? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't explain well, what, the dynamics well, why? Order, though. You say, yeah, but why? No, I mean, I don't know, but it's... Uh, I know, but you say, I know... To, and I'm, 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 this is an important point I want to emphasize. You don't want to give an explanation that somehow you need to the United States when this is a worldwide phenomenon and the U.S. is lagging everybody else, but not everybody else, but all the, all the other rich countries. Why have they been able to do it? Why do their children know more? Now, if you say, well, they, they have more stable families than we have, and therefore, and then we come back to the stable family argument. If you just say that young people don't know what the returns are, well, they seem to know it better in other countries. Why are uh, our children in the United States not knowing it. And there's some additional evidence that people know more. Uh, something I'm going to come back to about, I mentioned a number of times already, is that women are now getting 60% of the college degrees. Now, you find a lot of people start college, uh, and their start rates are almost as high for men as for women, but they don't make it through. The ones that don't make it through are usually the ones with low either cognitive or non-cognitive skills. So it's not, that would suggest they do know. They do know something about it. Uh, but, you know, there's some cost of, of getting through it. And maybe for those people, the return isn't so high, right? Uh, because they don't have the right, right skills. I'm gonna, uh, but I'm going to come back to that explanation. But that doesn't explain why they don't graduate high schools so much, although something similar may be going on on high school, um, and but that would come back to the early childhood investment that they're not really prepared enough to go on. Oh, they hate school that much. It's not much fun being in school if you're always at the bottom end of the distribution on grades and everything else, you know. It's, it's an embarrassment to do it. Uh, and so a lot of people don't want to go through that. They hate studying. They, they do terribly on all, all the tests. Um, so you have to bring that into the cost structure. That's what I'm going to, I'll, I'll be doing something like that. Yeah, okay, one more question on this, and I want to get, get going. So I guess your explanation about family structure deteriorating needs to apply more to the U.S. than to other countries. And I was originally going to, the way I explained this to myself, is that maybe a woman had entered the workforce and it would allow for um, single families or more single family structures. So is there a reason why it would be different in the U.S.? Well, I think if you look among, particularly among African Americans, the family structure, first of all, is a lot worse than in other countries, and the, the bulk of the population in other countries, and has deteriorated a lot over time. If you go back in time, uh, people aren't aware of that. And I'm going to go way back. If you go back to the 1910 census, because I know a study of that, uh, the black family was almost as stable as the white family. Well, not big a difference. Black family was stable. A little less stable, but more stable. And you went up to around 1950 or 60, it was pretty stable. So there's been a big change in that. I mean, there's a famous Monaghan report, some of you may have heard of it, who 1960-something uh, wrote at that time saying the deterioration of black family is going to cause a lot of problems for the black community. Now he was shot down a lot. People didn't want to hear it. Uh, but that's gotten hasn't gotten much better. It's gotten worse since then. So I think it is worse for these groups. And for the groups that are more comparable to what you see in Japan and the U.S., there is not much difference in dropout rates. Most people do finish high school here. Heavily concentrated in a few groups. Okay? All right, let me, let me go on now to a couple of other factors that affect um, the advantages. And I'm going to very briefly discuss two in the same way. And then we we'll begin to speak a little bit. So let's say there are a set of abilities. Let's 
spoke about those already, right? And then there's the amount of human capital you start with. Initial human capital at high school graduate. You know, remember, in my example, I was I was dealing with a simple case. You're, you're, everybody's a high school graduate and have to decide whether to go on for college. You can do it at any any other level too. Dropouts have to decide whether they want to finish or not. Okay. And the way I like to model these factors is to say two things. Now, how are you going to model it? Well, within the confines of our approach, which is maximizing discounted earnings, right? How do we, how, how, how would we model it? There are two different ways to do it. You can say, well, these things affect earnings, or they affect costs of going to college. I like to take the a cost side of it. Uh, I mean, you can do both, but in the approach I'm going to take, earnings are the same for everybody who goes to college, and high school earnings are the same for everybody, say. But if you go to college, this TC is a function of A with D, D, C, D, A less than zero, D, or less than zero. <coughs> that is, the time you have to spend to complete college is less for the more able. So, it, and or for the people who start with more human capital. <coughs> so, think of completion rates. Do you, do you finish high school in four years or six years? Well, it would be a function maybe of your ability. You get left back. You just have to repeat grades, as it's called. When my, you say you got left back. Right? You, you stayed at your grade. Okay? Or it takes you five or six years to complete high school. Are you getting your PhD? In economics, uh, some people get it in, let's say, three years. There are a few examples of a couple of people got it in two years. Um, but, and then there are people, it's a long tail on the right hand side. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's a function of a bunch of things, but presumably these two factors would be a variable. So putting it into that context, it doesn't make makes some sense that this is one way to think of how these variables operate. And you can do the same thing on the tuition, fees. For example, so if you're more able, you get bigger scholarships. We know that happens. Better students get bigger scholarships. And if you have more human, I'll do the same thing for the human. You have um, more. <coughs> uh, let me do that. Now we can think of this also. This is a little. It's a bit cheating, but. Because our framework is too rigid to be able to incorporate it. I think the F also is incorporating various psych the monetary equivalent of various psychic costs of college. Okay, or psychic benefits of college. That makes some sense. I mean, the fuller analysis would have some term like that. And so if I have better high school and a and better ability, my psychic costs all my psychic benefits of going to college are greater. This is what I said before. The, the person is going to be the last, the lowest grade, and never know the answer. When I, they get called on, it's not going to be comfortable, right? Um, so you may decide, well, I'm better off going and watch those videos that you were talking about. Spend <laughs> <laughs> so my time some, somewhere else and spending it in the classroom. So those people are... Uh, so you think of that also as psychic costs. Okay. 
not only just monetary costs. Like I say, it's, a little, it's finessing. You can have them really, to do that cleanly, you want to put it in the utility framework, which I will do. But think of it as, I mean, it's a pretty good approximation. Once we put it in the utility framework, you can think of it that, that this will come out like that, so we'll be okay. Okay, so uh, this gives us a little more flexibility now, because now we can we have a you know, I say a greater set of variables that uh, will help determine who goes on, who, 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 who doesn't. I mean it. We're going to have, if we put them down, we're going to have variations of what? Well, R, K, let's say superscripts are for individuals. K runs from 1 to cap N. Um, some people are more capital constrained than others. That's what we were interpreting. 2, M varies. Certainly between men and women and other groups. I mean, people have better genetic structures and the like. Three. Ability. And H not vary. Or three or four. Or T C <coughs> and F vary. Right? T. Yeah. Some people go work only part time, some work full time. Why? Well, I have to want to explain that, but that does vary across individuals and for within the sub maximization problem, I can take that as a factor. Okay? Um, well, I think those are all the factors we had because delta W we assume is going to be the same for everybody who goes on, by the way, just by the way we structured the problem. Okay, so now we look at market equilibrium. Look at a market equilibrium. Well, we would say what? Market equilibrium, say, is going to determine a WC over WA. And remember, that, uh, okay, so we have WC over WH. So let's say we have along this axis WC over WH. Along this axis, the number going to college out of some cohort. Maybe a steady state number. I like to think of this as a steady state number for first look, look at the data. So steady state fraction of people, college age, who go to college. Okay. Now we have a demand, demand function. Demand. This would be an economy-wide demand function. For college graduates, and we're measuring it, we're looking now at the cost to firms, profit or non-profit, of using college labor, and one of the factors it will depend upon will be the cost of college labor relative to high school labor, because they have substitutes to some extent. <coughs> okay, so the more higher the cost of college relative to high school labor, the lower the demand. So that would be one force making, uh, major force making negatively inclined. Now the lo location of the demand curve will depend upon the amount of capital, of other capital in, this, in the economy, because studies show that human capital is complementary with physical capital. I should have mentioned that before. Now, another fact that explains the rise in the earnings of college graduates over time from 1980 was the rapid accumulation of physical capital, where human capital, uh, and it, people have shown this, is, uh, it, is complementary with physical capital. Right. Low-skilled low workers are substitutes for physical capital generally. Now, there are some examples of physical capital that complements, uh, that are substitutes for uh, human capital too. So if you were a very skilled 
typist in the past, that's not so important anymore. The word processor and the like. Uh, so physical capital is partly substituted for, for the human capital. And there are many other examples of that that you, you can give. But in general, physical capital and human capital <coughs> complement so the growth of human capital. So this demand function, the location of a productivity level, this technological change biased toward uh, more high human capital, which people uh, bargain, as I said, in the So funds are forced to determine the location. And I'm going to deal with shifts in that location. That's the demand curve. So I think of that as a general equilibrium market-based demand curve. Okay. Now, on the supply side, On the supply side, well, that's going to depend, and that's tr traditional occupational supply. So if you, if you have a theory of a supply of people to an occupation, or hours to an, uh, to an occupation, uh, you, and the theory go, would go like, well, as you change the wage of the people in that occupation, you, you have a couple of effects. One is people in the occupation may work longer or shorter hours. And two, you attract in or out different individuals. So the intensive versus the extensive margin. Right? And for many problems, it's the extensive margin that's the dominant factor. Not so much the hours of work change per worker, but a number of workers who are attracted into the occupation. So most, a lot of occupation probably neglect the intensive margin can be dominated by the extensive, but both in general are operating. And we would say, so now we have to look at the extensive margin. And therefore we have to ask ourselves, um, how many people want to enter this, uh, go to college at different wage differentials, at different college premiums, okay? Now we'll come back to our formulation, we had a formulation, and the way I'm, uh, let me rewrite this formulation, so it looks like on a slightly different way. that we had was simple case, but I'm doing it a little differently. divided everything by, and I'm going to call this term, just to make it easier, delta W at and by 
setting it equal, delta W hat would be the compensating differential. The differential, percentage-wise, the ratio, college high school earnings, that would just equate the present value <coughs> of college to the present value of high school. Um, right? So these are all uh, uh, equality means that they're equal, the costs on this side and the benefits on this side. And so there's some compensating differential that will be equal. And that compensating differential uh, is, I mean, we have this little term here, so we'd have to say somehow, assume this is given as we vary the compensating differential, or we'd have to assume everything is as foregone earnings, and so we don't have any direct tuition. That's the simplest way of thinking about it. And we would say, for each individual, K is a W, is a compensating differential. And that K, and that delta WK is a function of R, K, for different individuals, ability, K, H0, K, MK, okay? Or more directly, it's a function of R, K, T, C, K, uh, F, K, of all these things, we can sign all of them. So what is a, a compensating difference is a good concept to have in mind. It's the point at which somebody's just indifferent between the two activities. That's it's, it's basic in theory of occupational choice. Okay? And so we would say, for example, D, W, is We raise R, we're lowering the interest rate, lowering the discount factor, right? So compensating differential should be negative, right? <coughs> more time you have to spend to get your degree, the more positive. So you can go through, you can sign all of these things from this equation. So then think of the supply curve. Now we, we, we have a sufficient statistic. We, we, we replace all these variables by the sufficient statistic of the compensating differential. And think of now as there's a distribution of these compensating differentials. And that distribution will determine the supply curve. Okay? So now we have here, think of this. So we have some supply curve like that. This is supply function. Um, and these people who went to here have a low compensating differential, so the waves, dif the actual differential is high. And the people went to here, people at this point, they have an, they're just indifferent between these two occupations. Everybody down here is getting rent from being a college graduate. They do better by being a college graduate. Everybody up here does better by being a high school graduate. Okay. So you have the the equilibrium compensating differential, we'll call that star, that separates out those two regions. And that's a function of, the, of this, the level and the distribution of these variables. Right? Okay. So that would be the equilibrium. I mean, the shape of this depends upon the, the joint distribution of all these variables. Normal who knows exactly what it would be, but um, it would be, you know, it would probably be really little mass at the very low level, and then there's a big mass uh, of, of people somewhere in the middle range, and then if the, you know, very, people have these very high compensation, maybe really thin. 
Now, an increase in demand, now we go from 1980 to 2010, and you can see, very simple, we have an increase from that to that, and an increase in supply, and so the increase in quantity going is going to be, as in any analysis of this type, a function of the shift in demand and the elasticity of the supply function. Put differently, the more people there are in that range around the equilibrium differential to start with, if there are a lot of people bunched closely around there, you're going to get a big increase in supply. Okay? And so if we try to rationalize the data, and people have estimated then, uh, and use this increase, this increase, an estimate of the demand elasticity that be from, you know, production function type of analysis. So we have this demand elasticity. Um, we have the increase in supply, we have the increase in wage, and then you can estimate something about the magnitude of the increase in demand. So that's what Merck and Katz and, and Golden and Katz do. But clearly, it's clear that um, given that both supply and, and, and price went up, that there was a greater shift in demand than in any shift in supply. Supply may have been shifting, and as I said uh, last time, during uh, most of, up until around 1970, in this century, uh, there was no change, no significant change in the compensating differential. So the interpretation was that there was a shift in demand, but at the same time, there was an outward shift in supply, maybe greater subsidy, so that the wage differential quantity went up, but the wage differential remained pretty flat. Now, let me <coughs> conclude this session today on an interesting or controversial subject. Why have women increased their college education, not only in the United States, but also in many other countries, much more than men? So much more that now in virtually every rich country a larger fraction of younger women are going to college than men and in many non-rich countries. Well, in 1970, we, we have some place have a, a, a static diagram. If you look at the static diagram in 1970, 1970, the, and what we, well, there are a couple of ways you can you can look at this, but if we if you just plot along here, fraction fraction women college minus fraction men college. Let's say age thirty to thirty four, or twenty five to twenty nine, and you, and you, this is let's say the zero point zero then the data looks something like that. Negative, uh, oh, I'm sorry, and here, 1970, yeah, one important thing. This is per capita income in the country. So, very few, <coughs> two or three countries, but pretty much all countries were below. And I didn't do a very good job of representing it, but they're all below that line, with one, just a couple of exceptions tonight. You do the same thing for 2010, which involves a little projection, but it also holds for 2000, per capita income, per capita income, the zero point. And now it's something like this. say this is the median income, median income across countries. Almost all the countries above the median are women have a higher fraction, and many of the countries below the median, women have a higher fraction. 
but still on the average, below the median, more men go to college than women. On the average, it's still true, but the difference is narrow. And above the median, on the average, more men, women go to college than men. Yeah, women go to, more women go to college above the median. Okay. So the U.S., in that sense, is not such an exception. We're a rich country, and we have now 60% of the four-year degrees <coughs> are women. So this is, these are facts. I mean, I don't think there's any question that these are facts. Okay. All right. Unfortunately for a lot of people, when they try to interpret that, they think of the United States alone. Ethnocentric, as uh, anthropologists might say. Okay. The, and the problem with thinking of the United States alone for this is that this is a pretty common phenomenon. So if you give an explanation that's very unique to the United States, it, it just can't be right. So I just gave a talk at some university in Wisconsin. Somebody got up. Oh, she was a woman, a professor. She said, oh, we've now demasculized men in the United States um, in the school system, so they just can't do well. I said, how does that apply? to countries like Japan and a lot of other countries where we're seeing this phenomenon, and Iran even. I mean, it's hard, hardly the explanation you give for Iran. Um, so, I mean, something unique to the United States can't be the right story. Okay? So that's the first important lesson to, to know. All right. Well, what is the story? Well, some people have said, very good economists have argued, this is because the wage differential from going to college is greater for women than men. Women, true, earn lower earnings, have lower earnings than men, but the gain from going to college is higher for men. I, I mentioned that last time, didn't I? And I pointed out that was, and we have a graduate student, William Hubbard, who, who, who showed that that was mainly due to the top coding problem. People didn't top code correctly. And more men are in this top code because they have higher earnings on the average. So while the wage differential only depends on the percentage increase, the top coding problem depends on levels. And the level problem was more serious if you, mis if you misestimated, let's say the top code was 60,000 over. If you said it was 70,000, it was really 100,000, the average in that interval. And that's biased for men and women, but it's much more biased than the earnings for men. And that's what he shows. And he said once you correct that, he finds you have very little difference. Now you say, well, health, women live longer than men. It's a fact, right? The stronger sex, from any life expectancy point of view, by a considerable margin. But the effect of education, again, you've got to look at the differential. <coughs> and now it works in reverse. The effect of education on life expectancy, that's one measure we have, is not greater for women. If anything, it's a little bit weaker for women, although women overall live longer than men. So I can't do it. Now you might say, what about marriage? More educated women formerly didn't get married so much. Now they do. It's true. So it's, you, you've had a narrowing of the gap between men and women of higher educational married. But we, men still, more educated men <coughs> still are more likely to marry than women. Just the gap is smaller than it used to be. It doesn't, but it didn't reverse. So it's very easy to explain why the gap between men and women going to higher education is narrow. That's no problem. You can see a lot more women are working in the labor force, and they're working longer hours. So they're still working fewer hours than men on average. So the gap now, now the, the challenge is to explain why this whole thing was reversed. That is the challenge. So I don't think any of the benefits things do it. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with the cost side. Well, what do we have on the cost side? Well, we have two, we, you know, you can think of two factors. We can think, the way I'll think about them are, one, how much human capital they start with graduating high school, and one, what their cognitive and non-cognitive abilities are, the mean and the distribution. Okay. Now, if you look at the mean of cognitive abilities, about the same. <coughs> 
Look at the variances, they're a little smaller for women. But, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna stress things like IQ and so on. Larry I let Larry Summers do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I want to stress, however, is if you look at just performance measures, performance measures, women there are two differences between men and women. Women grades and scores on, say, international tests like the PISA test are higher than that of men, typically, on average. And two, despite having higher scores, their variances in one measure of variability is smaller for them than men. And this is true in high school, it's true in college, and it's true on international tests. For the most part, I mean, it's not a, there are exceptions, but for the most part, they both are, are very true. And I said, we've accumulated a fair bit of evidence on that. Uh, so what's my th story? Uh, the story is that women, in the relevant interval, and that will depend on the relevant intervals, the relevant interval, the elasticity supply of women to higher education is greater than that of men. And therefore, when you have an increase in demand, there are more women who are capable of taking advantage of that than men. So the picture would be something like the following. I'm going to read you this. Let's say, let's say this is a demand. Yeah. And this is the new demand. This is the supply of men, and let's say this same wage differential, um, you can weight these wage differentials and getting an aggregate supply by their actual earnings. You can weight it by the actual earnings. We do something like that. And so you would have something, that's, if this is the equilibrium here, let's suppose the picture was something like this for men, like this for women. Supply of men, supply of women, and the aggregate supply, let's say, would be this. So, if we look now, if we look now, here's the wage differential to start, and this is the new wage differential. If we look here, more men go to college and win. So initially, this is 1970. I mean, not drawn very well to scale. Let's say 60%, 1970, 1970, 60% men, 40% women. And now because of the greater elasticity, now you have more women going to college in 2010. 60% women. The graph doesn't show that so clearly, but <coughs> women. The main point, I mean, I can get these fragment numbers lined up right. The main point is that the greater elasticity leads the supply curve of women to cross that of men before the new equilibrium wage, and therefore at the equilibrium wage, women, more women are going to college than men. That's the argument. Okay. Um, now, is it, is it the right argument? Well, I think I, I think it's the right argument. Yeah, I think it's the right argument. The, uh, is it proven beyond a doubt? No, it's not proven beyond a doubt. But we do have the evidence. I mean, we do have a lot of evidence on means of variability, which consists in maybe the supply curve was shifting more for women than men over time, over this period of time. That's another, you know, possible interpretation. We have. Some reasons suggest that may happen. I'll get into that next time uh, when, in a more general treatment of, 
of the uh, choice problem. Um, maybe we didn't get the estimates of the wage gains and all these other factors right, although it's hard to see where on the benefit side you're going to get up. You know, when we work fewer hours, you know, less married, the health effects are smaller. So it's hard to see on the benefit side where the benefits to women of going to college are great. Anything that we can measure doesn't just, you can't find it. <coughs> so we're, we're left with the, with the supplies, with the cost side. Now, unfortunately, we don't have direct evidence other than the fact that men are more likely to drop out of college than women. If you look at measures of non-cognitive abilities, they're, they're worse than women, and their variability is greater than women. Um, same thing on grades. So we have, we have that evidence, which I think is relevant for the German. That sort of general sort of arguments that should apply to a lot of countries shouldn't be unique to the United States. Nothing I said is particularly unique to the United States in the argument. So this is something that should be now generally applicable. Now, of course, in other countries, you have to look at the wage gains and so on, and those may differ uh, as for the US. But it's, it's a type of argument that I, I'm not relying on something that's special to the United States. So whatever argument one comes up with, you have to have an argument that's going to be generalizable outside the United States, because it's a general phenomenon. That's the advantage of having all this country data. We now know it's a general phenomenon. It's not something in the United States, so we don't want to be too U.S. specific in trying to give an explanation for it. Okay, well, we're, we're, get, we're getting out of time. Any questions? We have time to answer a few questions. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Health? Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, like, did you just No, we do know. Men men we, we do know about some of that. There's a couple of studies. We have a thesis going on by Yuri Sanchez on comparing the benefits of men and women, looking at changes over time. And there's a study by David Kep Cutler, uh, who's a health economist and some other economists. Uh, and they suggest two things. One, there's no evidence that the educational benefits, and we have the measure of health I'm using is life expectancy. Okay, well, the other measures we, uh, aren't so good. Um, there's no evidence the effect of educational life expectancy is greater for women than for men. If anything, there's a little evidence that goes the other way. Okay. Number two, if you look at changes over time, that's, that's the more controversial. There's weak evidence that the effect of education on health over time got bigger. I mean, Cutler and his co-authors claim that it did. Yuri doesn't find such big effects, so it uniformly. I must say I forgot some, uh, what he found exactly, but um, I, don't, I, I remember it. I don't think he found that. Um, so there were maybe some evidence that the benefits got bigger over time, but no evidence that they're bigger for women than for men either now or in the past. Ed, you know, health of women is better. All the relevant thing for this comparison is how education affects health. And there's no evidence that's greater for women. If anything, I'd say the evidence is it's somewhat greater for men. Um, so uh, there's not abundant evidence on the changes over time in particular because there are only limited data uh, on that, but there is some evidence. The evidence doesn't suggest um, that's, it's reverse signs, at least, that's not greater for women than for men. And that's the relevant thing in trying to say that's the force that's doing it. Okay? Anything else? Yeah? So, for the greater elasticity of supply of women, like how much would you... You have to speak louder. Um, so, to, just, to describe the greater elasticity of supply of women going to college, would you come up with a story of lower psychological costs for women to complete college? Or well... Yeah, in some broad sense, not necessarily technological, <coughs> women are better students, they like college more, they can manage better uh, to complete the grade. That, that's the story I'm giving. Combination of psych, uh, psychic advantages of doing it and ability to perform. That's the story. Um, that women, not every woman, 
compared to every man, but that women on the whole are better at that than men, and they're more similar. Two things, they're more similar so that elasticity is determined both by location and by similarity. And they're more similar. And the evidence, you know, it, 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 we need more evidence on that. So uh, I think that w that's an area that should be more research going on. Whatever and we've been able to collect does suggest that both those things are true. Yeah? Um, when we're talking about the, the difference in income between college and non-college graduates, men and women, um, do you know anything about what the distribution of those benefits is like? Because if if you had um, the distribution, um, if the distribution was much wider for men. Generally it's wider for men. Yeah, so I mean, could it be that um, since the people who are sort of on the, we're talking about people who are on the margin, usually going to college, not going to college, so they'd probably be getting on the lower end of the distribution. Presumably so, they're um, either they're high cost people or right, in our right. formulation there. See, in our formulation, everybody has the same wages, but in reality, of course, people right. have different wages. So um, they'd be a combination of high cost and low gain uh, yeah. uh, uh, people. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about the variability in, among those people. I mean, you have to look at the variability. From your argument, you have to look at the variability of those people compared to others. Or you have to argue, hey, here's an argument that I want to give. Uh, women have narrowed the gap in a lot of dimensions. Um, okay. But in one dimension, they're better off. And it's also a mean variance thing. They have less variability in their earnings. And variance, people don't like variance, so the men don't like variance, so they don't go as much. So that also uses variability, but now on the earnings side. Um, and maybe there's something to that. You know, you could also argue the high earnings that some people make is an attraction to going, and people are gambling on themselves. But it could be. That could be a factor. Yeah, and I mean, it seems like there's, there's what you're saying, which is that if you treat your going to college as you're getting a random drop at the incomes that people get after going to college, then that's... I assume everybody, my simple analysis, everybody gets the same earnings. Right, right. With, with the same education. But in reality, they don't. We know it shows up in differences in earnings. Yeah. And it could be that the greater variability, again, it's a variability argument, but it's now on earnings, greater variability discourages men from going and relative to women, so women end up going more. I think there's, you know, there could be some merit to it, although you could reverse that argument and, and say the opposite. But might be, that's true. That'd be something worth investigating. Okay? Anything else?